Chapter 16. Johnsy struts over as if I called his ticket number on a 50-50 raffle. I always knew I liked you, he says. Let's go, sis. We're burning daylight. Can you follow me to Granny June's? Then I'll ride with you, I say. We arrive at Granny June's house on the satellite reservation on the south end of town. Half the homes on the res are cookie cutter houses, part of a federal housing project funded by housing and urban development in the 1970s. The other half are what everyone calls her cat mansions. Ordinary but nice homes that contrasted with the nondescript HUD homes make the street look like a suburb where the moms take turns hosting Tupperware, Mary Kay and Longaburger parties. The two neighborhoods are a before and after of tribal economic prosperity. Granny June lives in the before neighborhood. Breaking in the driveway sharply enough for the tires to shout for Lily again, I share a bittersweet smile with Granny June. I hold out the Jeep keys for her, still clasping the tobacco pouch. She wraps both hands around mine. The key ring becomes a pearl in an oyster. I went to settle up for Benezique's funeral, and he said it was taken care of already. Hearing Lily's spirit name, I look down at my jeans. She continues in a voice as soft as I've ever heard from her. You didn't need to use your junia for that, miigwech. And for being her friend, chi miigwech. She squeezes her hands like a hug. I want to see this Jeep tooling around town, on campus at the mall, across the river, on the ferry. Can you do that for me, my girl? I nod. The lump in my throat bobbles as well. Johnsy's voice startles me. Come on, sis. I've got women to woo and bets to place. He taps his watch dramatically at my open window. I laugh. He's been married to the same woman for 50 plus years and plays poker for dimes. Granny waves me off when I get out to walk her to the front door. You be careful at that bad place, she calls out. I follow John C.'s powder blue Lincoln Town car with the fry bread power bumper sticker. The old landfill site, several miles south of town, is bordered by a small parking lot, a creek, and a forest of birch and black ash trees. He opens his trunk to reveal a mini workshop of plastic storage bins arranged like a Jenga masterpiece. Each blue lid is labeled in TJ's distinctive block lettering. John Z retrieves the bin for his collecting adventures. Treasure hunting. Bandolier bag, magnifying glass, storage bags, backpack, disinfectant wipes, dish towels, gloves and masks, antiseptic spray, bottled water. He slips the wide strap of a well-worn brown leather bandolier bag over his shoulder before putting everything else into the oversized backpack. I need to adjust the backpack straps from their maximum allowance to fit me. TJ must be his grandpa's usual collecting buddy. John Z rolls his eyes while handing me a pair of latex gloves and a breathing mask. TJ must have ingrained safety precautions into his reluctant grandfather. Stay here, good pony. He pats the hood of his car as we begin our adventure. The landfill is haphazardly arranged in reverse chronological order, with the newer junk toward the road. Mattress stains are still identifiable, black garbage bags are shiny, console televisions molt their veneer, a dollhouse with furniture inside. Why would anyone throw away? Nope, not going to follow that thought. John Z has no interest in the easily accessible stuff. He must know every acre because he quickly leads me through a trail visible only to him. Maybe time warps here because he crosses the uneven terrain on nimble feet that align with the stories of his boxing days. Meanwhile, I stumble like a toddler past the different decades of junk. The silence should feel tranquil since we are away from town and the highway. Instead, it's unsettling. Accompanying Johnsy was such an impromptu decision that I didn't think about putting any gijig in my sneakers. I need to be a smarter secret squirrel going forward. Maybe Johnsy doesn't care for the stillness either, because he starts humming. Once we reach his intended destination, he gives instructions. Now we're looking for old glass bottles that have raised writing or designs. 
No broken ones. Colored bottles are good too. If they still have a hat, that's even better. A hat? A cap, he says in a tone that, if Perry had said it, would have been followed by, duh. John Z resumes humming and pokes around piles of junk. Soon, his sounds grow lyrics, Finnish folk music from his mother's side of the family. He grunts while lifting a huge piece of corrugated metal and heaving it aside. Grandpa John Z, I could have helped with that. And shouldn't you check for spiders first? His look matches the duh of his bottle cap answer. Sis, do you think anything living stays around here? That is why it's so eerily quiet. No birds in the trees, no insects. I haven't swatted an oceum once, not a single mosquito. These birch trees with their scars of fungus resembling burnt charcoal will never be harvested for the medicine within the chaga. The black ash trees will never be pounded with a mallet to loosen the layers that hold a story for every year. No one will split their bark into thin strips, soaking some in berry or flower dyed water before weaving the black ash into exquisite baskets. Instead, these trees absorb contaminated groundwater and breathe virulent fumes. The Sioux is an old town, hey? He resumes poking around for glass treasures. Factories and farmers hauled their mow in here before the EPA and OSHA and whatever alphabet soup of laws said they couldn't. People who weren't thinking seven generations ahead ruined the ground. No bugs. Birds won't stick around if there's nothing to eat. Spiders neither. The four-legged's got the sense to avoid it, too. Um, if they don't hang around here, maybe we shouldn't either, I say? He swats the air in my direction. Eh, now you sound like TJ. He stands, stretching his still formidable wingspan. You two were quite the pair. Didn't last long, though. There's no way I'm blabbing about his pride and joy dumping me. I've moved on. Silent about it, he shakes his head. Just like him, too. The bottom of a brown bottle angles from the ground like an iceberg. I use an old license plate to carefully excavate it. As I rub the glass with the wipes, bumps become raised lettering. Hey, Grandpa Johnsy, this one says, Warner's Safe Kidney and Liver Cure. As I walk over to show him my find, I glimpse a stretch of grayish cloud in the southwest direction. The sky beneath the shelf cloud is dark teal. We need to get back to our cars, I warn. Squall coming in. He stands and sniffs the air, nods his head. Let's get away from the trees. Walk back along the creek, he says, placing the bottle inside his bandolier bag. I feel like an owl, turning my neck to check our pace against the shelf cloud. John Z's agile steps remind me of TJ on the football field. He sidesteps a single black garbage bag at the edge of the creek. I zero in on it. Wasn't the newer junk supposed to be closer to the road? This bag, still shiny, is fresh. The hair at the nape of my neck stands on end an instant before my brain registers the whiff of. Travis's hand shakes, making the revolver jiggle. I follow the tip of the barrel pointed at my face. He stinks, meth rotting his system from the inside out, burning my nose. Hey, what are you doing? Johnsy's voice is like a phone call with a bad connection. His giant hand jostles my bad shoulder. The sharp pain jerks me from the memory. What's going on? He looks down at the bag, squatting to inspect it closer. Don't touch that. I push him away so quickly that he stumbles backward. Sorry, sorry, I'm so sorry. My words rush as I steady him. It's just that there's bad stuff inside that bag. It doesn't stink like dead body, he says, dusting off the back of his jeans. Should we call TJ? No, I bark. I don't know if the FBI is working with tribal police. Ron hasn't shared that information with me. I didn't think to ask. My mind scrambles for a plan. Let's just leave it and get in our cars before the storm hits. We need to get home. Once I'm inside the Jeep, I wave to John Z and go through the motions of following the Lincoln town car. When it's my turn to pull into the road, I wait for him to speed away. 
After he rounds the curve, I reverse and turn back to the landfill. I want that bag. Chapter 17. Lily keeps two blankets in the Jeep, snag rags. One is a quilted moving pad, which I spread on the ground. I set the shiny garbage bag in the middle and use the moving pad to swaddle it. Squatting, I lift the meth garbage baby and gingerly place it in the back of the vehicle. I race home for the garage door opener Ron gave me yesterday. I'm back on the road when hail starts pelting the Jeep like shrapnel. I pull into a store parking lot along the business spur. Straight line winds rock the vehicle from side to side. It's darker than I thought possible in an afternoon. Soup's afternoon practice must be ending, so I call Jamie, who answers with, Hey. Hey, I mimic as lightning flashes an instant before a boom of thunder shakes the Jeep. Where are you? He asks. It must sound as though I'm at a battlefront. Kmart parking lot, I shout over the cacophony, on my way to haul some trash. He's silent a moment. Did Jamie catch the significance of my trash reference? Are you in your mom's car? No, Lily's Jeep. I'll meet you there. Don't drive in this storm, Jamie says. Wasn't gonna, partner, I say in fluent sarcasm. Does he think I'm an idiot? Don't call me that. He ends the call before I can swear at him. 20 minutes later, the rain eases enough for me to watch Jamie turn into the lot and drive past the Jeep. I'm about to tap the horn when I realize he's parked close to the store so anyone who recognizes his car will assume he's merely shopping. Okay, that's smart. I drive over to him, giggling as I imagine a spy-worthy intercept with Jamie making a slow-motion running leap. I reach for my phone to tell Lily, then slam the brakes. She isn't around to answer my calls or texts. Jamie sprints the rest of the way to the Jeep. He's drenched when he opens the door. What the? He begins in a raised voice before shifting tone. What is it? I open my mouth, but nothing comes out. He looks genuinely concerned. I focus on his tawny brown eyes. Switch seats, Jamie says softly. I'll drive. I climb over to the passenger side as Jamie takes my seat. We sit, surrounded by lightning, rumbling thunder, and heavy rain. Grandma Pearl loved a powerful Nichiwad like this. I blink until my head rests on Grandma's lap and she smooths my hair, as she did whenever I wasn't feeling well. It's how she comforted me after pouring my pee into my ear to cure the earache. I researched it years later, discovering what she had known. Urine is sterile and a substitute for hydrogen peroxide. What would my firekeeper Nokomis think about the surreal situation I'm now in? Could I even explain that I'm helping law enforcement officers from the same government that tried taking her to boarding school? If I told her about Lily and Uncle David and the sick kids on the res in Minnesota, would she know that I'm trying to protect our community and others too? Once the storm lessens, Jamie drives to the garage and after. He places the meth garbage baby on the countertop along one side of the garage. I grab the other snag rag, a threadbare quilt, and stand at the open bay. The air is a good 30 degrees cooler than it was an hour ago. Jamie stands next to me and runs a hand through his wet hair. He's completely soaked. I sit down, positioning one half of the blanket under and around my right side. I motion for Jamie to sit next to me and wrap the left half around him. The soft blanket still has a wonderful smell of campfire smoke. We watch the last of the storm blow over. When I finally speak, my voice is scratchy. My grandma Pearl loved storms. She'd sit in the garage like this and talk about the thunderbirds that brought our loved ones, our ancestors, from the other world to check on us. She'd say, tell them how you're doing, my girl. The thunderbirds blinked lightning, so every time it flashed, I'd wave and shout, we're doing good. <laughs> the gigantic birds I pictured had rows of elders, like in an airplane, waving back. I wipe away my tears and meet Jamie's luminous eyes. Do you think Lily was with them today? I ask. 
He inches over until his shoulder touches mine. I focus on his damp t-shirt, warm skin, and calming breaths. Jamie doesn't need to be kind to me. I'm on board with the investigation now. We established that yesterday in the parking lot at the falls. We are partners and nothing more. But I relax my shoulders and don't move away. I stay next to him just until the rain stops. Ron arrives as the sun reclaims the late afternoon sky. While searching through the workshop cabinets, he commends my quick thinking about the bag of trash. I wasn't sure if you were working with any tribal cops or if that information is confidential, I say. Ron is silent as he finds industrial gas masks and latex gloves in one of the workshop cabinets. It isn't until he hands each of us the protective gear that Ron responds. You should assume no one knows about the investigation, he says. No LEOs, not tribal, state, city, or even border patrol. Talk only to Jamie or me. Ron opens another cabinet and reaches for a packing tape dispenser with a thick roll of clear tape. My eyebrows raised quizzically prompt Ron's explanation for lifting fingerprints. Jamie puts a small plastic tarp over a picnic table behind the garage, as if we are having a cookout. He sets the meth garbage baby on the tarp and pulls out one item at a time like Santa at a Christmas party. The table fills with dented containers of brake fluid, individual pop bottles with gray, opaque residue, lithium batteries cut in half so their guts could be scooped out, drain cleaner, thin white tubing bunched like spaghetti, and a dozen boxes of cold and flu tablets, the plastic sheets all having hatched their pills. How could anyone buy that much medicine without being noticed? I ask. Michigan restricts pseudofedrin sales. Canada doesn't, Ron explains. I remember how Jamie laughed when I told him about buying stuff across the river. He had pretended to be surprised, but he'd been fishing for information. I don't buy cases of cold medicine. But I could. It isn't illegal. And you don't have the hassle of showing identification and filling out a form for the pharmacist. I thought you and Jamie could go to Marquette in a few weeks to spend time at the forensics lab. But now I'm thinking we shouldn't wait. Ron makes up a plan as he speaks. If I can arrange for the lab tech to work next weekend, can you think of an excuse to get away? Labor Day weekend might be the best time to be in the lab. What would Grandma Pearl do? I take a deep breath and hold it, remembering when the dogs barked and she had me hide. I watched her sit in a chair angled toward the door. Her hands were steady so her aim would be true. She was smart, resourceful, and incredibly brave. When I exhale, it's a long, controlled release. My new boyfriend and I can have a romantic weekend in Marquette. Chapter 18. A last minute spot opened up for a Labor Day weekend geology seminar at Michigan Tech that will transfer to Lake State. At least that's what I tell my mother on Monday. She accepts the lie without question. The lie is cover for Jamie and me having a romantic weekend in Marquette, which is a lie to cover my secret squirrel meth tutorial so I can be a confidential informant and help the FBI. Each lie is a fish with a bigger fish swallowing the one preceding. I call my aunt and tell her about the romantic weekend. Mom won't check on me, but auntie would. She isn't happy about the lying part, but it's not the first time we've deceived my mother. You sure you're ready? Grief can make us do things we normally wouldn't, she says. Normal left town a long time ago. I brace myself for the half truth I'm going to tell. Spending time with Jamie is the only thing that makes sense right now. Can you understand? Please understand, Auntie. The investigation will help everyone. I do, Auntie sighs as if she was the one holding her breath. Can you promise you'll be careful? Your Norplant doesn't protect against STDs. You think Jamie is a skanky puck fuck, I giggle? Girl, you don't know everything about his history. Girl, you said a mouthful there. She ends the call with, 
Be a smart Gwei. Lust doesn't last, but herpes is forever. On Tuesday, I make it as far as the parking lot next to the campus bookstore. I sit in the Jeep. I'll go in after the next song, I say aloud. An hour later, I give up. Tomorrow, I announce. I drive to Chimakwa Arena to spend time with my Nibing program kids like Mr. Vasquez had suggested. When we shoot baskets, I notice how TJ's cousin Garth interacts with the kids. He chats easily and offers encouragement. I miss shot after shot, even more than usual. My kids find it hilarious for a tall person to be so bad at basketball. I don't mind. Besting me brings them inordinate delight. When I leave Chimakwa, I catch my smile in the rearview mirror. I coast on my good mood all the way back to the campus bookstore. This time, I decide to pretend I'm on a game show where I race against other shoppers to complete my mission the quickest. Sometimes, pretending is good. I keep busy all day to avoid thinking about the weekend trip with Jamie to Marquette. Pesky questions still manage to creep into my thoughts. What do I wear to a federal meth lab? Will Jamie and I spend every minute together? What if I'm bad at making meth and they fire me from the investigation? Ron calls on Wednesday with details, asking if I would be okay with staying in the same hotel room with Jamie. Separate beds, of course, Ron assured me. Jamie will mention the trip to your brother. Sharing a hotel room is a precaution in case Levi and his friends make an impromptu visit. Levi will know about the trip? Everyone will think Jamie and I are dating? On Saturday, I park the Jeep in the secret squirrel garage and get into Jamie's truck for the drive to Marquette. We're halfway there when I ask how his conversation went with my brother. I told him I broke up with my girlfriend back home and was interested in you, Jamie shrugs. He was happy about it and said I'd better treat you good. I'm surprised to hear Levi's reaction. He must really like Jamie. Levi's overprotective and always gets kind of weird whenever I start seeing someone. Like, he can be a player, but I'm supposed to be chased. Unless I'm with a hockey god, I guess. You told him we were spending the weekend in Marquette? Yeah. He recommended an Italian restaurant. Said to make sure we're back on Monday for some cookout at the lake. Coach Bobby hosts a Labor Day bonfire. He's the varsity hockey coach at Sioux High. I shake my head. I still can't believe Levi's green lighting this weekend. Is he really this eager for me to be fully immersed in hockey world? We arrive at the hotel, an elegant historic building on a hill overlooking downtown Marquette and Lower Harbor along Lake Superior. As Jamie checks in, I sneak a peek at his driver's license and credit card, both with his fake name, James Brian Johnson. His address is the one he and his fake uncle are renting in the Sioux. I'm not quick enough to eyeball his date of birth, but I figure it must be a fake one that says he's 18. How old are you really? I ask as he unlocks our hotel room door. That info is off limits to you, he says, stepping aside to let me enter first. You don't think my knowing truthful things about you will help me live the lie better? I toss my overnight bag to claim the queen bed closest to the window. Nope. He drives me to the federal crime lab outside town. I hope he'll drop me off, but he stays at my side. Jamie is the herpes of my secret squirrel life. We start with a documentary about the history of meth. I wait for Jamie to sit before taking a seat across the room. The video is an arms crossed, detached chronicle narrated by what sounds like a combination robot, scientist, reporter. The ephedra plant was used in Chinese medicines for over 5,000 years as a tea to help open the lungs and ease breathing. In 1919, a Japanese chemist figured out how to reduce the essence of the ephedra plant, known as ephedrine, into a crystallized form, thereby creating the first crystal meth. History and facts aren't what matters. This is hurting my community, I tell the robot. Meth was once a legal medicinal product. In the 1930s, you could buy amphetamine inhalers to treat asthma. People liked the side effects, bursts of energy and euphoria. So pharmaceutical companies developed a pill version. 
Angie Flint was always a beautiful woman, but last week in the funeral parking lot, she looked as rough as her son did. At the powwow, Travis was nearly unrecognizable. Visible physical effects of meth. But what about the damage on the inside? The toll on them and their loved ones? During World War II, troops were given meth pills to make them better soldiers, able to stay awake for long periods with hyper alert senses and an increased willingness to take risks. Is that how it starts, Mr. Robot? Lost boys trying meth to play video games longer? Partiers wanting an all-night buzz? Dieters thinking it's the answer to a prayer? The negative side effects also became known. Paranoia, hallucinations, delusions, and heart irregularities, including heart failure. There are places in town everyone knows to avoid. The alley behind the seediest bar and a bunch of small houses down a dirt road people call Dogtown. Even an area behind the fitness center at Chimakwa and the last stall in the second floor bathroom by the sophomore lockers at school. Meth has become the most abused hard drug in the world. Over the past three years, from 2000 to 2003, the meth industry has grown from $8 billion to $17 billion. It is on track to top that in 2004. Why can't I stop thinking about those niche kids in Minnesota? When the video ends, the guy in the lab hops up from his seat. So, who's ready to make meth? Lab guy is eager, like meth boner giddy. This isn't fun and games, I snap, recalling Travis's jittery hands. Lab guy dials it back, acknowledging the seriousness of the situation, blah, blah, blah. The meth tutorial begins with us putting on protective jumpsuits with hoods closed around our faces, breathing masks and goggles. I stay peeved during Lab Guy's review of beakers, digital scales, flasks, and condensers. We're starting with the most complicated process for making meth because it takes longer and needs overnight drying time. As soon as I pick up the gel doll flask, I'm transported to a familiar place. Science world has laws, standards, order, and methods. I'm fluent in its language. I immerse myself, grateful for the single-minded focus required of science world inhabitants. On the drive back to the hotel, Jamie glances at my legs bouncing anxiously. Where do you want to get dinner? He asks. I shrug and look out the window. My jittery legs continue. When we finished at the lab for the day, we removed our masks. The off gases, which smelled like nail polish remover, a fish cleaning shack, and cat pee are embedded in my nose. I can't unsmell them, and I forgot to pack anything to smudge myself with except Sema. Jamie, what can you tell me about the kids from the reservation in Minnesota? When he doesn't answer right away, I ask a more precise question. What do you know about the group hallucination they had? The kids were out of it when they were brought to the emergency room. They were aggressive and seemed paranoid. They wanted more of whatever substance they had been using. Their drug screens came back positive for meth. The kids were hanging out in the woods and they snorted crystal meth together. The medical providers noted the kids alternated between pleading for more stuff and being scared and not making any sense. Each one had the same hallucination of men coming after them. Men chasing them in the woods? I say, everyone saw the same thing. Yes, whatever was added to that batch of meth brought on a group hallucination. Once their parents arrived at the hospital, the kids wouldn't say anything else to the medical staff. Jamie pulls into the hotel parking lot. He remains seated in the truck, so I stay put as well. The FBI has been investigating meth activity. The incident in Minnesota was unusual enough for the FBI to look into the different substances being added during production. Do you know how the kids are doing now? I hope their community has good resources to help them. When Jamie admits he doesn't know, it reinforces how different we are. The FBI is interested in learning what caused the group hallucination. I want to know if the kids are okay. Back at the hotel room, I take a long, hot shower. My skin is bright pink and tingly when I dry myself. Mom always sneaks a travel-sized bottle of lotion into my toiletries bag. Lilacs are to mom as roses are to Grand Mary. Tonight, I'm thankful for the sweet, cloying scent. 
Smelling like a lilac bush after a gentle June rainfall, I emerged from the bathroom wearing stretchy knit shorts and one of my dad's old t-shirts. My stomach comes to life a second before I register the pizza loaded with everything waiting on the table. Jamie ordered dinner and had it delivered to the room. I wasn't sure how you like your pizza, but I figured it was better to have to pick stuff off than leave out something you like, he says while flipping TV channels. When the screen shows an early scene in The Godfather, I give a thumbs up. He turns up the volume. We watch Levi's favorite movie while I demolish half a pizza and a side salad. While Jamie is in the bathroom, I call mom and then text auntie. Me, in MQT, all good. Auntie, your pleasure is equal to or greater than his. Make sure he knows that. Shaking my head at auntie's shouty text, I shut off my phone. After Jamie exits the bathroom, I go back in to brush my teeth. The scent of his soap lingers in the steam. When I agreed to be a secret squirrel, I had a hazy notion of what it might involve. I never imagined repeatedly inhaling the soap that makes Jamie smell like a surfer on a tropical beach. I don't know what to do with Jamie's thoughtfulness. It's easier for me when everything is black and white. He is my point of contact for this investigation. He's not my friend. I climb into my queen bed and stare out the window. You want to talk about today? Jamie asks softly in the dark from the other bed. No. I'm a frozen statue of a girl standing in the woods, unable to move, carved from stone with my eyes wide open. The wood smell of earth, bark, and simultaneous life and decay. Lily walks away from Travis, but he grabs her arm. She jerks away from him. I can smell the chemical odor seeping from his skin. He pulls a gun from the back of his jeans, spins around to point it at me. WD-40. Someone used WD-40 to clean the gun. Lily is stunned to see me at the edge of the woods. Her mouth moves as Travis makes slashing motions with the gun at random points. He aims at my face once again. Lily reaches out for the gun, brave hand demanding it. He shoots and she falls backward. Acrid gunpowder. His mouth moves, but there is no sound here. Only scents that don't belong in the woods. Copper. Acetone. Urine. He raises the gun to his temple. I wake up like a chased rabbit. Shallow bursts of breath and heart skipping in its haste. Chemical odors are absorbed into the pores of my skin. They're even on my tongue. I swallow and taste the odors that burn like cheap whiskey. It's the first time I've dreamed the smells from that night. Jamie snores softly. I count each loop of his respiratory cycle. A low rumbling happens when he exhales, followed by a gentle inhale. I make my breathing mimic his pace. It sounds like calm waves stroking the shore. I become the sand and let his snores caress me back to sleep. When I wake the next morning, I have an annoying headache, menstrual cramps, and dampness between my legs. The selling point of the birth control implant is not worrying about missing a pill. The downside is the unpredictable periods. Jamie is up by the time I finish washing the stain out of the sheet. We have an unspoken pact. I will not mention his morning boner, and he will say nothing about bloody sheets. Can I run with you? Jamie asks when he sees me dressed in running clothes. Hells no. I can't get used to running with Jamie again. Secret Squirrel World needs to be black and white. Jamie, I need time to myself. We're going to be at the lab all day. I look away from his dejected expression. Since I'm on my moon, I don't set down any Sema with my morning prayer. Women are at their most powerful during menstruation, connected to life-giving forces. Auntie gave me teachings. The reason we don't use traditional medicines and we're not around ceremonial fires during this time is that we carry our own medicine and fire within. Others may act as if it's something annoying or unclean, but even the way we refer to menstruation is respectful. Auntie said, None of this being on the rag or the red curse. Your moon is a mighty time, Kue. I feel better after a five-mile run on a path along Lake Superior. 
even more so after a shower and a quick breakfast with Jamie. We take a cab to the federal building, leaving his pickup truck in the hotel parking lot in case Levi and his friends decide on an impromptu trip to Marquette. If they see the truck, they'll assume we're having a marathon snag fest. We begin by donning our protective gear and checking on yesterday's meth. Lab Guy sets up dehumidifiers to accelerate the drying process. Then I learn four simpler methods for making meth. Quicker and less complicated, these are the versions I'm likely to come across. Throughout the day, Lab Guy teaches us meth lingo so I can pick it up in overheard conversations. I mentally catalog the slang into three categories, familiar, unfamiliar, and camouflage. The familiar ones are the obvious words like speed, crank, and ice. The unfamiliar words are weird ones like kooky, gak, and yaba that would catch my attention. The most difficult slang words are camouflaged as common terms such as chalk, cookies, and quick. How do you know when cotton candy means meth or, you know, actual cotton candy? I ask lab guy. Context. The succinct response makes me feel like there's an exception to the saying, there are no stupid questions. Jamie asks about gangs. The only gangs I know of ride snowmobiles and live for hunting and fishing, I say. Jamie laughs. The sound reminds me of that brief time when I thought maybe everything would be okay. When we were buddy and ambassador, before Lily reached for Travis's gun. I can't revisit that before. It's too complicated. Lab Guy shows us meth paraphernalia to look for. I focus on holding it, smelling it, getting familiar with it. We look through photographs of meth layers, closets, sheds, trunks of cars, motel rooms, remote cabins, a bathtub and toilet, a three foot tall plastic drum and campers. At the end of the day, Lab Guy inspects the results from our various batches and tells us what a teener of our meth would sell for. Teener is short for teenager, as in sweet 16, a 16th of an ounce. There isn't much difference between our batches from today, but when Lab Guy checks our results from yesterday, mine looks like clear glass and would fetch a higher price than Jamie's product, which is decent, but slightly cloudy. It feels petty of me to take satisfaction in the comparison, but I ride that petty horse all the way back to the hotel. At the hotel room, I take another marathon shower and slather myself with lilac body lotion. Jamie eyeballs my dad's t-shirt, which serves as my nightgown when I emerge. We really should go out to dinner, to that restaurant Levi recommended. I sigh. My brother's behavior is confounding. I suspect there's an ulterior motive for why he's so pro-Jamie. Jamie explains. It's called backstopping. When you make sure your story checks out, in case anyone asks, you have something solid as proof. Like your fake ID? There is a hint of an edge to my voice. Now it's his turn to sigh. He also adds his signature pinch to the bridge of his nose. He never used to do that before. That must be the real Jamie, the one he hid from me. I leave an exasperated Jamie in the room while I change in the bathroom. Years of traveling to hockey games made me an expert in packing a weekend bag. We always had to dress nicely for post-game activities. For this weekend, I included a pair of black slacks, black clogs, and one of the many elegant blouses Grand Mary gave me from the boutique. Tonight's top is a red draped stretch jersey. Jamie is dressed for dinner when I exit the bathroom. He is wearing a button-down shirt, black pants, and smooth black leather dress boots. The cream-colored shirt contrasts nicely with his tan skin. His hair is slicked back, which makes him look a little older, more sophisticated. Is this Jamie's normal image when he's not posing as a high school senior? Should I tell him that he looks too polished, that messy hair suits him? I say nothing. The Italian restaurant has classic rustic decor, checkered tablecloths and tall candles melting over vintage Chianti bottles in wicker-wrapped holders. An elderly couple at the next table holds hands. Jamie's left arm rests on the table just like the older gentleman's arm. I'm unsure how far we take the backstopping precautions. Do I hold his hand or keep gripping my thighs beneath the table? Jamie watches the couple next to us before meeting my eyes. 
I'm 22, he says. It would be easier if I immersed myself in the fake girlfriend role. I was able to be a good secret squirrel at the lab, learning about and cooking meth. Why can't I simply play along now? Because I felt something for Jamie when I was getting to know him. It was real for me, but not for him. He played along too well. I think you had it right the first time, I say, breaking away from his intense stare. Probably best if I don't know real things about you. Shields have two sides for a reason. Okay, Jamie says quietly. A waiter brings crusty bread, still warm from the oven, and a plate of olive oil with grated Parmesan and a dash of balsamic vinegar. I rip off a chunk, dip it into the oil, and shove it in my mouth. We eat dinner in silence. Anyone looking at us would surmise we are on a very bad first date. We appear to have zero connection. Ron said we needed to establish relationship patterns so people would buy into our cover story. We have failed miserably.